Um, because we have two teachers who need to be ready at 8.20, we'll start right away. Good morning, everybody. I'm Scott Butchart, Dean of Students. Thanks for coming at a different time than usual. I appreciate that. Um, given the state of the contract negotiations, we moved it to the morning. And um, I wish there were more of you who had been able to come, but people will filter in a little bit. Um, Madame Ameona. Of course we're filming it. Uh, on TV, finally, Mom. Uh, Agnes Abihala, foreign language, world language. She's going to speak only a few minutes because she has to run off and teach. So, good morning. Uh, is this okay? You can hear me? Fine? Yes. Um, I really don't have anything very different from when you came as parents of 8th graders and ninth graders and now parents of 10th graders. Um, basically, I think for most of your children, they will continue in the language that they are in and uh, follow the recommendation that they've worked out with their teacher. Um, we have some students who, who move up levels. So let's say they were maybe in a three honors class and they're trying to go into a four advanced class. Uh, that's a few students, but it always happens. And we have a, what we call an action plan. So that's something they should discuss with their teacher and it involves uh, observing the class and doing some work that could uh, match the gap between the two levels. Uh, so other than that, we have, uh, as you know, five languages. We have Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, French, and Latin, and you can take those languages at any level. So if maybe they're interested into in uh, uh, switching languages, uh, they could take a beginning other language, or maybe they have some heritage language at home, um, and in that case, they should meet with me and, um, and take a placement test um, to find out if we have a, a course that might be appropriate for them. Um, what else to tell you? Not that much, really. Um, we have a World Language Support Center that meets uh, every day at different times, and that will be in the information that Mr. Bouchard had put together, and will be sent. Um, will be sent, and it will tell you how it will be sent. Um, I think that's it. Do you want to, if, you, if your child wants to take two languages, that, you know, we have about 20 students um, every year who take two languages. That involves making sure that they have their um, three years of elective credits ready so that as they graduate there is no, no problem. So that's something to work out with the counselor. And also sometimes they're scheduling conflicts. So uh, it's a possibility. We're not always able to do it. Uh, any questions? Yes. Yes, yeah, so generally we have uh, like an independent study uh, with someone guiding them, particularly in the Spanish language, because that's where we end up having the most students. Um, and uh, the other courses that we have in the summer is a Spanish one for original credit, so someone who, for you know, a variety of reasons hasn't been able to take a language and they want to get their first credit over the summer, that's how they could get it. Because uh, as you know, you need two years of uh, world language in order to graduate. And then most colleges really are looking for at least three, so. Anybody else? Yes? Did you say uh, in order to take two languages, you should be done Not d done, but make sure that between their junior and senior year, they will have everything that they need to graduate. All right, well. Off to my French class. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Birchnell, and I'm here to talk about English for juniors. And my job is very easy because there aren't tons of choices. In fact, there are only two choices. And every student must take English, so that choice is already made for you. Um, it's just a question of whether um, the choice will be standard or honors, and those are the only two levels that we offer. And as juniors by now, they should have some idea. Freshman year, they had to make that choice. Sophomore year, they either made that choice again between standard and honors, or they're in a multi-level class, and we're hoping some of the multi-level classes might encourage students who might not otherwise think that honors was a possibility, to think that honor honors is a possibility. Um, the biggest difference, I would say, and the, the both courses are focused on tensions inherent in the American dream, both what is wonderful about the American dream and 
what are the problems with it or in what way is it perhaps not um, what it's cracked up to be in reality. Um, this is at the same time they're studying U.S. history. I see Dr. Shipman just walked in the room. So it is a year focused on this country. The main difference in the courses is really not so much focus, but is in the pace of the reading. And so that is what I urge you to think about. And I know your English, that your child's English teacher will be thinking about that and making course choices for next year. Um, because the reading goes very quickly in the honors course and not as quickly in the standard level course. But we hope the challenge is the same and the rigor is the same and the skills that they acquire are the same. Um, there is a junior paper in the junior year where students read two works and write a comparison paper and that prepares them for their senior paper, senior year. Um, really great books, um, some of which I'm sure you read in school and a lot of new books as well. You know, we do The Great Gatsby, Huck Finn, uh, Song of Solomon, uh, The Woman Warrior, Joy Luck Club, History of Love, uh, and a bunch of new texts. I should have brought a, a better list. Um, so there are lots of great books this year, and we think it's a great experience for juniors. Uh, I think that's pretty simple, all I have to say. Questions? Yes? This year there's real world literature and... Future world lit. Right. So is that sort of similar with... There's two different honors options this year. Is that the same next year? Or is there... There's similar? only... It's only one honors level, that's it. So sophomore year we did, we opened it up. We were playing with sophomore year a little bit to experiment to see how that goes. There are ideas about doing something like it eventually with junior year, but we haven't gotten there yet. So we have gone back to, to the way it was freshman year, which is two levels only. Yeah. Are the junior year classes combined standard and honors like some of them are sophomore? Or they are not. It's just straight honors. It's just straight it's honors and standard um, junior year. Yes. The list. Oh, yeah, it's on the catalog. Uh, I think I brought it, but it's over there. So, but um, feel free to go and read the list of books, or write me, and I'll tell you the most updated books. Yes. Does the for kids who've been going through the sequences, does junior year sort of feel the same level of? hardness to them, or does it feel like a step up if you're thinking about the overall package of courses? Well, that's a really good question. I think in general, uh, students feel that junior year is tough all around, and I think that sort of has its reflection in each individual discipline. I, I do think that um, it, because the mixed level classes have been differentiating their work more in independent reading, so the students select the work that is at their difficulty and challenge themselves at their difficulty. It can be a leap to go back to a pure honors class, for example, where you're doing all class texts for the most part and you're moving at a very fast clip with the rest of the class. So it's going back to that from freshman year and I think that can feel sometimes like a leap for a student who might be on the edge of you know, honors and standard that can feel very challenging. Um, so I guess I guess my answer is yes. A junior year is a little bit of a, a step up in terms of pace and rigor, but teachers are very aware of supporting kids along the way, too. And they're aware that it's a tough year all over. Yes? Who teaches? Oh, goodness. Lots of teachers. Um, who teaches English? Yeah. Oh, I, I, don't even, I don't even know. First of all, we never know until the end of the year, but you know, there's like 12 teachers who teach. I have to rush to my class, but thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. Uh, hi, good morning. My name is Josh Paris. I'm chair of the math department. So we'll talk about math for junior year. Um, it, math is a little more complicated in junior year in that there are lots of options, but for the most part, kids who are in a certain uh, pathway in 10th grade, the majority of them continue in that same pathway in 11th grade. So. Um, the kids are in, in Algebra 2 Advanced this year, will take Pre-Calc Advanced next year. Kids in Algebra 2 Honors will take Pre-Calc Honors. Uh, kids in Algebra 2 are going to take in 11th grade. They have a couple of different options. Um, there's a course called Trigonometry and Analysis, um, which is um, sort of a pre-calculus course and uh, the majority of students in Algebra 2 will take that. There's another option for them um, which is a course called Algebra Topics and Technology, 
which continues on with the study of Algebra 2 um, and also spends um, half of each quarter of the year in the computer lab doing, uh, looking at math investigations through a spreadsheet perspective. So um, that's a good option for kids who aren't finding as much success in Algebra 2 and also have an interest in learning more about computers. Um, yeah. The other uh, pathway we have is, is IMP. So kids who are taking IMP2 honors in 10th grade um, will continue on and take IMP3 honors in 11th grade. Um, you can, if your child is not in IMP right now, they can jump in in junior year without having to do any additional work. So IMP is an interactive math program. It's an alternative um, sort of sequence of courses that we have that starts in grade 10. So the majority of students start in grade 10 and go 10, 11, 12. But the curricula is such that you can jump in after 10th grade without having missed any content. Um, so your teachers will be talking uh, to your children about that. And we have um, some of our IMP students will be going into the 9th and 10th grade classes to talk about IMP to see if it may be of interest. Um, so that's, that's it. Honestly, moving levels, it, it, it can be done in 10th grade. It's honestly the, the most challenging to change levels after 10th grade. After 9th grade, it's very easy. Even after 11th grade, it's easy to move up a level. Um, after 10th grade, the, the, the curricula, the courses are in different places. And so it can be done, but it requires some, some work, some additional work, either in the summer or in the spring. Um, if you have a student who is interested in moving up levels, they should talk to their teacher and then talk to me and we can figure out if it makes sense and, and put a plan in place for that to happen. Um, the one other thing I would like to talk about is starting this year we have three math courses um, that are uh, computer programming courses. And students can take these courses for either an additional math credit, if they need one, uh, or um, as an elective credit. So we have two new programs. One of the courses already exists now. That's called in Exploring Computer Science Engineering. Um, that course exists in the uh, Career and Tech Ed Department. And we have been able to um, allow students to take that for math credit. Uh, and then we're introducing two new computer programming courses, um, each a semester long. Uh, the first one is in SNAP, um, a block-based computer programming course. And the second one is in Python, um, which is a super popular um, computer language. So um, we've done a lot of research on what additional computer programming courses would be good to have at the high school. And we kind of settled on these two. Um, you know, we talk a lot in the high school about 21st century skills that students need to have, and I'm not, I, I may make the case that computer programming is right at the top there. Um, whether you go into a, a computer related field or not, having that skill is crucial um, going into the workforce uh, moving forward. Um, so, we want to, um, we've sort of been thinking about this over the last couple of years and are taking a two-pronged approach. One is to introduce these new courses, and two, um, we are going to be looking at our curriculum and hopefully introducing programming within our math courses, grades 9 through 11, probably not so much in 12th grade because that's a different ball game, but um, figuring out units that we can do in our courses that complement the curriculum that, are, that use computer programming because like I said, uh, we want all students to have that opportunity. And hopefully, um, if we do that in ninth grade, that students will be interested in taking computer programming courses um, outside the math department as well. So um, yeah, I think that's what I have to say. Any questions? I have a question. Um, can you talk about the difference between senior year, the AP, BC, AP, AP, and the whatever it is, and how that tracks? Uh, yeah, most of the advanced, the question was about senior year and AP calculus. Um, most of our advanced, uh, kids in advanced math will take BC calculus, eight, um, and the kids in honors will go on and take AB calculus. These are two AP calculus courses. Um, I have no idea why they're called BC and AB. That's, uh, BC goes, uh, so BC finishes the AB curriculum halfway through the year and then goes, goes beyond that. So it moves, it goes into greater depth and moves at a much faster pace. Um, you can, there are a handful of students each year after 11th grade who move up and jump up and take BC calculus from honors. 
So you can do that. And there's also a handful of students who are in advanced and decide that they kind of want to, they don't want to, they, they don't want such a quick paced course and they drop down into AB Calculus. Yeah? Uh, those two new courses that you talked about, are those considered electives? Uh, you can take them for elective or math credit. So um, the majority of kids need more elective credit than math credit and so they will take them for elective credit, but the two new courses I mentioned are being taught by math teachers. Um, some students, for a variety of reasons, the students going to on the Chinese exchange program, um, students who have an illness and miss significant amount of time and maybe lose a math credit along the way or lose a half math credit along the way, and they need that math credit to graduate. And by the way, to go to a UMass a state school in Massachusetts, you now need four years of math. Um, so they can they can use those um, those credits uh, as math. Also, for seniors who um, aren't interested in pursuing statistics or calculus, which most of our seniors take, they could take these courses for their fourth year of math credit. Yes, sir. Are there any prerequisites for the new classes? Um, no, they, um, the students should be <coughs> capable of doing Algebra II work. Um, that's the level of kind of abstract understanding that they should have. Um, Beyond that, there are no prerequisites. So this is, we're going to have hopefully some freshmen in this, these courses all the way through senior year. To take, I would say to take the Python course in the spring, um, the courses are meant to go in sequence, like first you do SNAP and then you do um, Python. However, I think a lot of, many students have experience with Scratch, which is a very similar language to SNAP. And so if kids have experience in that, they can jump into the Python course in the second semester. Or do you have many, many, many numbers of the, the same course? Yeah, I, I hope we have that problem. I hope we have lots of kids wanting to take these courses. And um, if we have a huge high demand, we can offer more sections of them. I mean, we'll have to deal with that when we come. Um, some of the seniors sometimes have trouble fitting in, fitting everything in their schedule since by senior year, there are a lot of singleton courses, meaning courses only offer one section. So it gets a little tricky. But I'm pretty confident that we can get everyone in these courses that we that, that want to take it. Yes. And is Python going to be offered in the fall as well as the spring? No, it's it's a, they're meant to go in tandem. Like we would like kids to do a full year of it. Okay. So we're going to offer that one in the spring and then the SNAP um, course in the in the fall. Yeah. Yeah, they include a lot of trigonometry. Um, about half a year of trig. So there was a question to Ms. Birchenall about the level of challenge. Um, math in 11th grade is harder. Um, and we don't, we don't sit around going, hey, let's make math harder in 11th grade. Um, trigonometry is a bear of a subject. And it's so abstract. Um, and there's, it's, it's a challenging math topic to learn. So, and as are other topics that are taught in 11th grade. So the math just. As kids learn more math, as they acquire more skills, the math gets more complex, more abstract, and therefore more challenging. Um, so it's great because you can do a lot more because they know a lot more. It also ends up being challenging. All right, great. Um, well, thanks for coming. If you have any other questions, please feel free to, to email me and I'll get right back to you. Hi, I'm Gary Schiffman, head of the Social Studies Department. Uh, I'd like to tell you about two things. What all students will do, can you hear me okay? What all students will do junior year in history, and then we have a couple of optional courses I want to tell you about. Next year is US history. It is a state graduation requirement. It's a Brookline High graduation requirement. Every student must take a year of US history. It's a survey course. Just as the 10th grade year is a survey of modern world history, the 11th grade is a survey of US history. We offer, the difference, the biggest difference, is that we offer, we offer uh, US history at three levels. This year, we offer modern world history at two levels. Your kids are either in standard or honors courses. Next year, there's a third choice, AP, Advanced Placement US History, and that is a course that will prepare students to take the AP exam in the spring, really soon. They don't account for students. <coughs> um, 
So that is an option, and we have this year, I think, six sections of that course, so a fair number of students choose that option. It is, I will tell you, our highest attrition course outside of senior year. Psychology is our highest attrition course uh, because students get there and realize, oh my god, this is science. Uh, but, and seniors, seniors make different kinds of choices, but in junior year, AP US History is our highest attrition course, which is not, the vast majority of students enroll and take it and succeed in it, but it is hard and it is very fast paced. So it's a choice to make deliberately, not accidentally. Uh, so if you have a kid, typically a student in 10th grade honors, this actually should be inevitable, the student will have a conversation with the 10th grade teacher and they will discuss whether honors or AP is the best choice for that student. And that is a mix. Typically we make a recommendation based on what we think the student is capable of, but for this transition from sophomore to junior year, we're also saying, what do you want to do with yourself? What do you want to do with your junior year? What do you like best? Do you want to push that hard in a push? Or would you prefer that I recommend you for honors and because you're going to do other things or you want to balance your load or whatever it is? So expect that conversation. If it hasn't happened already, expect it. And if you're on speaking terms with your children, feel free to ask them about it. <laughs> I usually text my daughter's friends when I find out that way. Uh, so, uh, the three levels. The guidance I give to teachers, and we actually talk about this with the seven, eight teachers. If your if your child needs help, if I gave if I gave my daughter a textbook chapter in U.S. history, I said, read it, tell me about it, write to me about it, and if she can do that independently, I think she can should go to the honors class. If she needs help to make sense of that, to make it come out right, cannot do that independently. That's what we do in standard level classes. When I teach a standard level US history class, I break down the reading, I check on it, we work on the skills so that we achieve reading independence. A lot of this has to do with maturity. A lot of it has to do with all the things going on in a teenage brain, which is saturated with all kinds of chemicals. We only have faint traces of them left. So sometimes that extra, diff that extra support and scaffolding makes a huge difference. It's the difference between feeling good about learning and feeling like it's not going well. And that's a terrible feeling to, to uh, to carry for a year of school. So if your student is not an independent reader in history, standard is the best choice. If your student is an independent reader and loves history and wants more of it, A push is a great choice. Honors is our broadest range of students. Students, many students for whom this is their first honors class because they have achieved independence in reading and they are willing to work hard enough to maintain that independence as it gets harder. And we have students who could very well do A push and decide they don't want to. Some of them terrible choices in science, Ed will talk to you about that in a second. Others if they want to balance that advice. Uh, so that's, that's the picture of US history. We try to know who we're teaching. I'm teaching US honors this year at the middle level, and I'm trying my best to know who's in the room with me. We always try to do that. That's our job as teachers. But this choice means there is some sorting and some there's new information, and therefore there's more imperfection in placement than there was previously, and that happens mostly with English. If you have questions, please give me a call. The uh, second thing I wanted to tell you about was two optional courses your kids can apply to take. Global Leadership, which is a wonderful course that introduces kids to how global development, particularly public health, the teacher of the course, is very interested, very connected to the public health community. Kids will want to know how people go about exercising a leadership role or a participatory role in global affairs. Uh, he does fun things with them in the building, like he sends them off. He says, you must leave the classroom, you must contact me, and you must give me a briefing on how you would spend a million dollars to reduce the incidence of HIV infection in Africa. So you have to find a place, they have to make a Skype phone call, <coughs> problem solve at many, many levels. They interview people abroad, again using Skype. Uh, many of them take trips associated with our Global Leadership Program. Uh, kids who are thinking about working in some way in either development in international business or in international affairs generally should really take this course. I have to say we are very lucky to have the instructor for that course, Mr. Carl, who we have now. He's done an amazing job and he, and he knows the world and he's talking about very well. The other course we have as an optional course for Rising Juniors is a Social Justice Leadership Workshop, which is a course uh, we've offered this for a long time now. It's a wonderful course for kids who are interested in, in some ways, the domestic version of the Global Leadership Project which is how do you get involved and how do you become a leader in your community, work in nonprofit organizations, work in community organizations. Students do, I've, got, I've gone to prison with these students and heard testimony from inmates. Uh, they have 
workshops, uh, lots of guest speakers. They do independent internships. They go out and work in a, com in a community organization and they report on that. Again, a wonderful experience. These do not replace the state or school graduation requirement of US history, so it will be in addition, which means they need, need, your kids need room in their schedule in order to take these classes. Questions? Yes. <coughs> These are both, the optional courses are both full year courses and they count as generic graduation credits, which for most students doesn't mean much. Because most, most of the students who take these courses have plenty of credits. And so it doesn't fulfill the elective requirement. That must be done, ceramics, career tech, and that sort of stuff. Yes, please. How competitive are these two optional programs? Uh, it's really, they can be competitive because of funding constraints. We can't offer that many, they're optional, so we can't offer that many sections of them. Depending on the year, we do turn away a fair number of kids. We'll try to, try, well, I mean, if your kid's interested, tell them to take the application seriously. It's very easy for us if a kid submits an incomplete application. Then we don't have to worry about the merit of the application beyond that. Uh, of, the, of the completed and well, well done applications, uh, we, we prioritize kids who will get another shot at it, kids who have not had similar experiences, things like that. The applications ask, are you applying to the other program in which do you prefer? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. For a student who's doing you know, quite well, not scholarly, but you know, doesn't dream about history all the time, um, what's the workload, I guess, or how much time commitment should they budget for, uh, for honors versus AP if they consider those two? So honors, is, there'll be no shock involved in honors. The homework load will be similar to what they've confronted in the past. There will be shock with it. Do. And I don't know about all, but that's okay. Second question: I don't know if you know how many students would take uh, two AP courses in junior year, for instance, uh, the history. A lot will. A lot of you know, a lot of kids, aspiring students, going to grade level, you know, AP language, AP history. My own kid at home is taking three AP classes in another town, so there'll be a multiple AP load for a lot of kids. So that's that's the balancing thing that Gary alludes to. So, so when I see the attrition thing, it's not the only explanation, but some of it is social. Uh, in what way? My friends are doing several AP classes, therefore, mm -hmm. since I'm their friend, I should too. We can have friends who have different capacities in different areas, mm -hmm. it's a good thing. And uh, it's a hard conversation sometimes to have, teachers, parents, even among kids. So I should report him. He, he never does homework, and he gets A's on all his tests. And that will run out for that guy, by the way. <laughs> it's called college, just wait. But uh, you, you know, the comparison among friends can be dangerous for kids. They have to really do an honest assessment. What can I do and what can I be happy doing? And so they're not done making peer judgments when they should be making goal-oriented judgments. Please. I was just going to ask if there's a lot of optional courses that those available in seniors. They are. Both, both are. Uh, global leadership tends to have very few seniors. That's also open to rising sophomores. Tends to be mostly sophomores and juniors. Global leadership, uh, social justice has lots of seniors. If you're thinking about prioritizing, I would start with global leadership. Yeah. Can you touch on the It can be. So that that it, it's the pace of the curriculum. Uh, so this is a little bit about national geography. So schools in the South get out much earlier than we do, and they start much earlier than we. And the college board has decided to accommodate those schools since it's a national test. So the test is given early in May. As you may know, we'll be here till late August once snow days are done. <laughs> so the problem is that we have to do our entire year's curriculum very early. We have to complete it very early. And despite the fact that the college board has adjusted the test, and it's a better test now. It's much more based on reading prompts. You read something on the test and you respond to it, which is a much better skill for kids to work on. The fact is they still expect you to know an awful lot. So simply the, the volume of reading on, in a very short amount of time. Reading independence, if it's important in honors, is absolutely crucial in A-Push. So they have hours of reading every night? Uh, not every night. <laughs> there are lots of crunch times. Before the exams, kids really hunker down. And there is still writing. We do a research paper every year in, US, in, uh, in the history department. They still have to write a research paper. It's a lot of work. It is. And, and it depends a lot on the, the kid's capacity. So everybody gets faster. I mean, in our jobs, we get faster at the routine tasks. 
So the students in the fall will struggle, and many of them will make the adjustment, and they will they will bring the workload under control. But you can expect a certain amount of adjustment period. I forgot to say, but let me say now, there's a summer course, a wonderful summer course by Jen Martin, who's taught the course many times. She's not doing it now, but she does a summer bridge course. For students thinking about APUSH, not quite sure if they're there yet, one way to figure out is to do the summer course. You go in with a bunch of notes already done, and you learn the techniques for doing it efficiently and with great comprehension. And the students who do that course, I believe, do better, and some of them decide not to do it. Not bad options. Yeah. So if you, have summer a, course, yes. if you have a student that is on the bubble between a, an AP or, or an honors, is it better to get a higher grade in the honors versus a lower grade in the AP? Where do you stand on that? So th there is evidence about this, and I'm not the keeper of that evidence. <coughs> Guidance counselors are good, are good people to have this conversation with. My daughter did the honors, not the A push. She's a junior right now. She'll be a senior. Okay. And she's very independent. And we talked about it, but she made the decision. Um, my impression, I didn't say this to her explicitly, but my impression is an A in any subject is a good thing to have on your transcript. Thank you. Yes? Okay. Um, Jen, you have So students will often brag about boot camp. Uh, which I'm not sure is the, it's, it's, again, it's not, I don't find that persuasive, but, uh, uh, but the real skills, there are certain formats on the exam, the DBQ, uh, document-based analysis, there are certain skills that the College Board has actually done a reasonably good job of naming, defining. We use these skills in our other classes, but we actually pursue a variety of skills. A-Push kids probably learn less about oral presentation, but about analysis of text and connecting text to a short open response. Is that a real skill? I think it is a real skill. I think I use it at work, actually. So I think there's something to be said for that. And there is also something to be said. It's the logic of the survey course, which again, I hope happens in all of our classes. We could focus on a topic and go in depth for a year. And many schools pride that we do that. It's really wonderful. But remember, our children don't know anything yet. Not really. So they don't know the sweep of things. They don't know what it was like in the 1830s, how different it was from the 1930s, how different it was from today. So because of the pace, sometimes the A-Push kids, I think, do come out with a better sense of, wow, I see the story. And because they drill on it. My hearing is awful, so no, but. Research paper, like on all classes. Uh, there, I, I wouldn't say there is. There are not more essays. We we write in all the classes, but there are more of these specialized forms of writing. The DBQ happens a couple times a quarter. Uh, open response on exams happens a lot, uh, and notating. Maybe if you ask students, what's the biggest difference? They'd say the notes. Lots of notes. They get to know Brinkley very well. There are lots of in jokes among our A push crew about. Alan Brickley, who wrote the textbook we use in that class. If you go on YouTube, you might even see some amusing videos about it. <laughs> yes? Um, just to go um, to back on your question versus like, you know, AP versus like honors, like, do colleges like have a certain expectation? Um, do they want to see like a student in my AP class? Um, like, what are the expectations just like from a college perspective? One AP class, one AP class, like, so, Guidance counselors know this for real. I have heard students and parents say, uh, the, the, the colleges always say, take the hardest classes your school offers. I have also heard them say, get A's in every class you take. <laughs> right? So I mean, right now, and I, whether it's a bubble or not, there are people shorting the college market. Colleges want it both ways. They want everyone to have a 4.0, and then they want to pick among people who have 4.0s. We had a student who went, to, who went to Stanford who took honors U.S. history. We have lots of kids who take honors U.S. history and go to very fine schools. The A is the most important thing. The grade <laughs> is the most important thing. And, and the so same not every kid's going to get A's in whatever classes they take, but at the end of the day, what the grades mean is what you did. 
even the tests, the SATs and the ACTs, the letters of recommendation, all that other stuff, you have so many chances to prove what you can do in school. Every class is an opportunity to show, yes, I can do this. Which is wonderful, and in a way it's very humane. Because you can mess up once, and then get back on the horse and do better. You can have a freshman year that's full of bumps, and then do better. Uh, so, just for sanity, and believe, because I also believe it's true, I would spend a lot of time trying to do well in school. And then all the other stuff, try to reduce the noise. Just a, a different perspective. Um, so I teach at MIT, I advise freshmen, um, not lately. Um, I have had wonderful freshmen come through who have not taken a single AP class, and oddly okay. enough, they were able to get into MIT. Mm. Now, they were, in fact, with this one. But that credentialing, at least at, at that level, is not the thing. There's also that life thing, which is if you can do well in your classes, that's a good proxy for it. You'll do well. <laughs> you know, and my understanding is that's one of these admissions that you really best look at carefully. Yeah. So I have a question about the grading. Um, I took AP and Paleolithic. We got our grade bumped up two grades because of AP versus standard. Yeah, many years ago. So how does it work here between standard and honors and honors and AP? We don't, we don't calculate a, we don't weight a GPA, we don't calculate a GPA. It wouldn't matter if we did because colleges would recalculate it. <laughs> so each college will give you a different answer for their answer to that question. But I mean, like, if, if a child's in an honors course, does their grade automatically get bumped up versus if they were the same? But colleges will do something with that transcript, whatever they, whatever alchemy they perform. <laughs> <laughs> they, they will wait if they choose. So roughly how many juniors take AP? Uh, most students take honors, the middle level. So yes, we had I think nine sections of honors, six of AP, and four or five of standard. How many students per section? Uh, in the honors sections, the honors in AP 25, but we start here at 30 in AP, and uh, and 20 in standard. Yes, sorry. My daughter asked me to ask. I like history, but she's really interested in. She's got a lousy freshman teacher. <laughs> in the social and cultural and philosophical aspects of history more than like the power struggles. There's more time and room for culture. <laughs> oh no, this is your other, this is, you had a terrible one. Your other daughter, your first one, your other one had a terrible answer to you, right? <laughs> uh, there's more room and time for culture. There's more room and time for film. There's more room and time for the arts in the honors curriculum. Than the honors curriculum? In the honors curriculum, okay. by far. Versus AP. Versus AP. They, put, they have to read the entire Brinkley book by May. <laughs> yes. Is the SWS honors, they don't, they don't have any question the SWS, Correct. right? Is the honors in SWS, um, U.S. history, the same as the honors in the same? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, Jen Martin in SWS is teaching her a course in, uh, as a project-based course. But if she were still in the mainstream, she'd be doing the exact same thing. It's, it's, a, it's an honors U.S. history. Go on to science. Hi, I'm Ed Weiser, head of the science department. Um, in, in terms of the, the conversation that I'd like to have with you, first I have to talk about biology, but also um, some of our additional offerings. And I would say that in terms of APs, when you hear colleges and students going on college tours where they say, take all of the APs that you can, what they don't realize is that at Brookline High, we have almost all of them, and it would be impossible for a kid to take that many APs. They're talking about a school that, for their AP science offerings, it's maybe AP biology. Like, we have all of them, which is very rare, very rare. So that also has to be taken into consideration. Um, but before we go back to that, let's just talk about biology first. Um, in biology at Brookline High, we have th three courses. It gets a little bit trickier than the chemistry offerings. So we have biology one, which is a fabulous the, a college preparatory course. Um, we have great teachers doing that. Fabulous things are happening. If your student um, you feel as though they might want to get turned on to a science a little bit more than they have before, great place for that to be. They're doing everything that you would want them to be doing in 
a biology course. It is the standard level. Then we have biology BSCS. BSCS is um, a terrible name. It go, goes back to the day when we used the BSCS cat, uh, textbook. Um, we use that more as inspiration as opposed to the textbook anymore. It was uh, designed to have it be more inquiry-based, where students were given more problems and tasks and um, case studies. Um, and so we've made the course even better than that one was, if I dare say so. But we haven't gotten rid of the name yet. We haven't really figured out a better name for it. Um, so it is a great place for students to go if they work collaboratively, if they learn more, if they appreciate the process of learning in groups. If they appreciate the process of learning more independently, then I would suggest either bio one, Biology 1 or Biology 1 Honor. Biology 1 Honor is more biochemical in nature. We get through a lot more in terms of specific content than we would in the other courses. Um, it is a very rigorous course. It is probably as rigorous as a lot of AP Biology courses in many other uh, districts, but since we do physics, chemistry, and biology, biology being third, students have uh, more skills with math, analytical thinking, data analysis skills, so we, we can make it that, that, at that pace. Biology BSCS, going back to that one, is a, mostly a biology BSCS honor course, but there are some students in there taking it for standard credit. That's a very unique situation. So I will give you this. Take the advice of the current science teacher to help make that recommendation because they will have a good conversation with her child in terms of what is the best match for, for them. Hopefully that makes sense. And also, the, while I'm talking about the process that we have, once teachers talk with your children about um, which course is best, keep in mind they are not also talking to their kid about a push or all of the other courses. So once, so part of our process is the teacher will talk with the, the, the child, have the conversation, then make recommendation. If there's also a consideration of AP chemistry, then that goes back to the guidance counselor and the guidance counselor is going to have to meet with your child about the overall course load because we absolutely do not want to tax kids and make them go you know, just a little bit just trying to figure out how they can fit everything because honestly you can't do it all there's just too much to offer you can't do social justice all of these other courses and two science courses as a junior you need to just take a step back and try to figure out what would be the best match um, so that's that um, so you know why don't I take to see if there are any questions about just biology and then I'll talk about the AP chemistry after that yes so is it the case that so all students, all juniors each take a, a biology course depends on the level you're going to choose? Yes, so that gets me to summer school. A lot of students want to figure out what they can do over the summer so that they can race ahead so they can fit it all in. Summer school in science is a terrible idea. It's an absolute, and I'll tell you why it's a terrible idea. We do as much as we can to fit things in from September to June. I don't know how anybody thinks they can actually learn a lot in basically six weeks. Um, so not only that, but if you are thinking about doing something over the summer, do something unique, something that is really outside of what we teach. Um, I would encourage you to look at things you know, in, in math, like game theory, just like those types of things. Have your child explore, do anything on his or her own. Just try to make up an experiment. I've got a beehive up in my office because that's what a kid did. He decided that he was going to study bees over the summer. Couldn't get the permit for his house. And they said, well, why don't you just go and ask Allendale Farm? So he did. He studied what the bees did right before it, um, it started to rain. Okay. It was amazing. So, so, but yes, biology and U.S. history are two junior year requirements. And then you can choose any other science course if you want. Yes. And Yes. Yeah. Yes. So is there an AP biology option? AP biology comes after junior year biology. Yeah. That, that, so yeah, but it's it's exclusively seniors in AP biology. Yeah. BSCS stands for 
Oh, now you're going to quiz me. Biological Sciences Curriculum Survey. It is, I, instead of one or two authors, I think there are like four or five hundred of them. And, and it's, it's a whole, it's the name of the textbook that we don't actually use. But we can't come up with a better name because it, we just haven't really figured it out. And it, it does mean something to the people in, in the sciences. Yes? Yeah, you had mentioned uh, three courses of biology, college prep, which came in standard and honors. And you also mentioned BS, CS, uh, standard and honors. What was the third? Did I miss something? No, so it, I'm sorry. It's, it, to be clear, what I used to say to, to help out, there are two flavors of biology, biology one and biology one honor. And then the other flavor is BSCS, standard and honor. But the reality is, BSCS is mostly an honor course. We have a, a, a handful of kids taking it for reduced credit. It's, so you can take it at the standard level. But if your child is better suited for the standard level, because they're going to access more from it, our biology one class is honestly the better place for them to be. So just so I'm clear on that, the difference is the structure of learning, what is group versus individual? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and the group is the BSCS yep. environment. Yeah. Yes? Okay, so the question is for people in the back row. Biology one standard, uh, Correct me if I'm if I didn't get your question right. Biology one standard is more is still along the lines of group learning. Yes, all of the classes do a, a fair bit of group learning, but in biology one standard, the curriculum is a little bit more aligned to biology one honor, which is a little <coughs> bit more biochemical. Um, the BSCS, it's a really honestly, it's a hard course to describe because what students. Let me give you an. A, a, a little vignette about what would happen in biology BSCS. So students are given the task where they choose, they're in a group, and their group gets to choose a biome, one of the seven, 11, I guess, and then they work on that. They dive deeply into that, and then they make presentations. That's going to take a little bit more time than just saying, here are the biomes, get it, right? And just try to absorb that and move on. So once the BSCS kids do that, choose their biome and make their presentation, then they actually have them up on the wall and then everybody will take an assessment from that where they get to actually use other people's presentations to help they consolidate the knowledge and move forward. Biology 1 is a bit more like Biology 1 honor in the respect that it's more biochemical and there are good study, study techniques, but they rely less on that the whole class working together as one, if I made one big organism. <laughs> um, okay, if you have any more, oh, yes. I just want to come back on the, the SCS, so if you're good, yeah, the student's experience in that uh, bio example is primarily working within a small group for more of the time and then for a smaller fraction of the time, absorbing and taking in what the other small groups did. Is that characteristic of the term that most of the group is done, most of the, the student's work is done in? smaller groups or as a collective class? They do it in both. So if I can kind of go get right into maybe the, the heart of the question. If the students who don't appreciate biology BSCS are the ones who, and trust me, I, I've got four kids, I know how yeah. much they, oh, the group work, oh, the group projects, you know, where one kid does the brunt work, yeah. right. So if a, if a student is going to kind of rely on the rest of the group to learn, they're not going to be successful, and the group is actually going to feel okay about that. So if your child really appreciates the group work and just thinking out loud, they might appreciate BSCS more than one of the other courses. So that's, yeah, that, so it's kind of the converse. So if you're worried that your child's going, ah, oh, they hate group work, well, if they hate it because it, they, they can't stand somebody else, um, Carrying, you know, piggybacking on them, then don't worry about that. Yeah, that's the other kid who's actually going to have a hard time.
Um, that's a really good question, and I wish I had a better answer than the fact that I think it's it's set up so much to rely on the group work that the the individual assignments they have worked out over the years, and this is this was the heart. The problem with the original DSCS text was that it didn't take that into consideration. That's one of the reasons why we've moved away from it so much. Um, and so when students work as a group and make those presentations, the assessments are still individual, but you get to rely on the work that all the other students did. Um, so, uh, all right, so if you have any more questions on about biology, feel free to ask them. But now's the time where I talk about additional courses. So. Over the years, we've, we've been able to figure out a way to have students have an additional science course as juniors. Because they have just taken chemistry, we can't really do AP physics because the, they might not have had all the math yet, but they have everything that they need to know in order to be successful in AP chemistry. We do have, on average, three or four sections of AP chemistry. Most of the kids in that class are juniors. We have a number of seniors who have decided to, to take it um, because they wanted to do, say, a push as juniors, and they really liked AP Chemistry, but they just wanted to wait the year. Um, but we do have AP Physics 1 and 2, which is um, formerly known as AP Physics B. We have AP Physics C, both the mechanics and electricity and magnetism. That's exclusively seniors because of the math prerequisite. We want kids to be either in AB or BZ calculus, so those are seniors. Um, we also have AP Biology. AP Environmental Science. We have engineering courses. We have a brand new engineering course. That new engineering course will be exclusively for seniors. So the former course is now open to juniors and sophomores. Um, there's a lot of scheduling pieces to this because that, that old engineering course is now, it's called Engineering by Design. It went from six periods per week to four periods per week, so now juniors can fit it. They can also take it for career ed credit or for science credit. There's a lot of information here, and that's why I think that if you go to the publication that we've, we've, we have for all of the sophomores, they will be um, looking at the biology courses on the one side, and then on the back it has a checklist for all of the courses that they can think about. The reality is, if a student really wants, as a junior, rising junior, AP Physics 1 and 2, there are more seniors who take that course because of the way that our curriculum flows. So juniors might be able to have a spot in there, um, and I, I can't remember how many requested the course and are, are in it, but there are a few there. But it is something that we have to, to kind of work around, but AP Chemistry is basically the optional course for juniors. Now, who is the type of student who should take it? Students who have loved chemistry and want to take it again. I think that's my best answer. Um, trying to balance their schedule is also very important, making sure that they have U.S. history, but also all of their elective credits taken care of would be a good way to go. If they're thinking that, you know, well, I want some of my elective credits, I really want to do another science course, then I would encourage them to do engineering at the, the junior levels, engineering by design, and it fits, it's four periods per week, it's easier to schedule, and you should be taking it for career ed credit, not science credit. Um, some people feel as though colleges might look at it differently if it has a different credit on it. No, they're going to see engineering. They're going to, if, the, if your child is really into engineering, they should take that course. And then think about their senior level. Yes, it, it's one of our in-house things that makes it so that students can get their elective credits. Yes. It's, that is a really good question. I do get that a lot. I think there's also a push for kids to take an AP course of when they're toddlers, yeah. as opposed to <laughs> when they're almost in college because it's supposed to be a college class. Um, but I have never found that a senior has done worse than would have expected because they, they've forgotten it. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Right, so it's six periods per week. So imagine that being all of A blocks and two of the B blocks. 
when they get to be seniors, it actually gets to be a little bit easier to schedule if they want to take two AP Sciences. Sorry to put that out there, but a bit, two AP Sciences kind of dovetails because it would be A block and two B blocks for the one, and then we can have them generally match to the C block with the other two B blocks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Somehow it works out, but for the juniors, yes, they would be free those other two blocks, but often we can have them take either their health and fitness, and some of the other courses sometimes fit into those other D blocks. For student, I, I, did I hear that somebody was an SWS parent? A lot of times we have one of the AP chemistries be the other two F blocks so that town meeting can be one of the other ones. Um, yes, sir. So approximately how many students take AP Chem each year and how many juniors take AP Chem each year? About, if there are four sections of AP Chemistry, three of them are basically the juniors. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's, it's about 70, 75%. I'll ask one more yes. question. Sure. Um, so you made the comment that the student taking um, science class over the summer is probably not a great idea, right? Because they have to cram it in in six weeks. You said to your comment was to do something unique or different, mm -hmm. right? Does that all, in your mind, does that also apply to the maths, to the to the, the writing? Where my head goes is, if the kid has, the kid wants to take an elevated class during the school year, and wants to reduce his workload. What would be the appropriate class during the summer to take? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, and I'm glad that Gary uh, reminded me of the summer course. That's kind of the what do you call it, the bridge course for, for AP US History. I love that idea. I think that that's a great way to go for students to, to figure out if that's what they want to do, too. Um, another thing to consider about summer courses is they're not at that honor level. They're not going to say that honor level. Um, there are some schools who say that they do it. I, I've heard from students it doesn't feel like an honor course because it is. It's over the summer. There's not enough time for you to do, there aren't enough nights of homework or schoolwork to be able to reflect on it and take just to, to, to take some time and to even perform those labs over time. And so I think that summer school is, the reason why it's a terrible idea is because it doesn't really ever advance a kid. I think it's good for special situations, but if you're going to be taking biology over the summer so that you can take AP biology as a junior, for those students who have done that, it honestly has never worked out. Um, but if there are some gaps, if any of your kids are, if they're here at Brookline High for the first year and they, they took biology somewhere else, we, we should probably come up with a good plan for them because that's the hardest part is when students move in here from another district, they say, oh, I've taken biology as a ninth grader, I'm ready for AP biology. <laughs> it, it's, it's, our system doesn't really accommodate them, so those are the types of things. But yeah, I would love to, if, if your child is interested in science, um, come to me, we'll come up with some, some good things. So one of the craziest things that a kid did over the summer was <laughs> he cut a hole in his, the, the floor of his house and <laughs> made um, a whole organ, like with a, a shop vac in the basement blowing air, and he made like for two octaves, and he had the pipes going up through the staircase. <laughs> yes, they did, yeah. It may, there might have been an old duck there. I have no <laughs> idea, you know, but, but those are the types of things that really help kids propel forward. Thank you, Ed. If I can ask for one more moment of forbearance with a special guest. Uh, we've taken our whole hour. You guys are all, you know, amazingly complicated. Amy Byer, whoever, if you have one more moment for her, would like to talk to you about a special program called ACE. Thanks so much. And I know people are probably eager to get out. I'll be as quick as I can. Um, the ACE program is a new program here at Brookline High School. This is our second year in existence. It's a competency-based program. And we actually offer um, all four academic content classes within our program. It's um, attracted students um, from a whole spectrum of students who have been sort of bored and restless in traditional classes and have not felt challenged enough and want to have more control over their education. And it has also attracted students who have really struggled in traditional classes because their learning style is non-traditional. And they do better with project-based learning. They do better with performance-based assessments. Um, we do largely use performance-based assessments rather than tests so that students can show us what they know uh, through various means, really almost anything that they come up with that we think um, is rigorous enough to show us the knowledge that we've taught them. Uh, so 
it's a, it's a unique program. Competency-based learning is really taking off across the country. You, you may have read about it. Um, it's really allowing students to earn credit uh, by proving that they understand and know the material rather than using grades. Um, so in our program, students actually can't fail. If they don't show us that they know and understand the material, they just get an in-progress, an IP, which means they take the class again. But our classes are only six weeks long, and they're thematic. So students have a chance to take it again more quickly than they would if they were in the mainstream. Um, so we are actually having an information night tomorrow night, um, and I will be talking in much more depth about the program. And I will also have several parents coming to share their experience of having their students in our program. Um, you may have read about us recently. We just got recognized by the Rennie Center for being an exemplar in the state of Massachusetts for student-centered learning. Um, so we're excited about our progress so far, even though we've only existed for a year and a half. Um, and we're hopeful about the different innovative offerings we're going to be able to provide for students, which include internship-based learning and having our students out during school hours, earning academic credit and in-depth internships in the community, as well as college courses at Roxbury Community College for students who meet the criteria. So our philosophy is quite different from what you've just heard. Um, our students don't take AP classes, but they can take actual college classes if they're ready. Um, and our courses that we offer, as I mentioned already, are, are thematic in six weeks. Um, we also are looking to explore the possibility of um, an engineering course that would be more of a makerspace um, invention course. And that's kind of in the works and probably won't be offered for September, but the following year. So I'm happy to answer any questions right now, but I would also encourage you to come tomorrow night if you think your child is interested, or if you know another BHS student who might be interested, maybe not your child, but somebody um, that you know in the community. I'm gonna leave these out here. It gives you the time. It's actually right in here tomorrow at 6.30. Thanks so much, I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day.